Hey, welcome back. In this episode, we're going to talk about testing. So in this previous uh, episode, we talked about Ruby blocks, procs, and lambdas. And Shamugam reached out and said, hey, it would be great to see some content about Rails API request specs with our spec for both controller and model. Thanks in advance. So here what I wanted to do was first, we got to go through the process of just setting up our spec in a Rails application. So there are a couple of tools that I like to use in any production app. And so I want to just go through the motions of just first adding those tools and talking about sort of the bare minimums. And the first is our spec Rails. So the R spec Rails gem is a Rails specific uh, wrapper around the RSpec tools, and it gives you some um, additional functionality uh, on top of RSpec for like generating certain things. So this is the tool that I use for Rails testing. Now, by default, when you set up a Rails application, if you don't skip tests, then your Rails app will come with mini tests, which is just another test framework that is different from RSpec. Now, RSpec, in my opinion, is uh, a little bit more common in industry, even though Rails defaults to mini test. Um, and both both have tools to do all the testing that you might want to do. I just prefer RSpec, and so this is the tool I use. The other tool that I use is FactoryBot. This used to be called Factory Girl, I think. It's a tool by ThoughtBot. Yep, so here's how you can transition from Factory Girl. Um, it is a tool by ThoughtBot that provides um, factories for creating your data models and working with your data models instead of using fixtures. So fixtures are basically just like hard-coded YAML files that you would set up um, and that are loaded as kind of like the whole world of your database um, at once. And instead you can use fixtures, or I'm sorry, factories. And a factory is a class that is responsible for creating instances of objects. And so um, this factory bot tool is really handy when you want to either build and not persist something to the database or create something that you're gonna then use in your test. Um, and then we'll also talk about customizing the, the generator. So um, there's a bit here that happens automatically with RSpec and RSpec Rails um, that we probably don't want the defaults for. So let's jump into our code. This is, we're gonna use our Form 4 Tracker uh, app that we've been building on. All right, so the very first thing we wanna do is jump into our gem file and add a gem here. So under the, I have a, a group for development and tests and I have a group for development, but I also wanna add a group that is just for test mode. And in here, I'm gonna add the gem RSpec Rails. All right, now we'll go bundle install. This will install that, um, that RSpec Rails gem. Next, we can say Rails G RSpec colon install. This will create a couple of files for us that we'll need. It'll create a .RSpec file where we can configure what the test runner looks like and spits out. It'll create a spec directory with a spec helper and a Rails helper. Because we already have existing models in this application, now we can say like Rails G RSpec colon model user to create a, an, a model test for the user class. Now this is one of the tools for generating specs for us automatically. This will create a file here in spec models called the user spec. And now if we wanted to run this, we could say RSpec spec slash models user spec, and that should run the, the test. Now by default, these are created with a little bit of a wrapper around them um, in order to just show you that a test is pending. Now, when I've run this, I actually run into my very first error that is unexpected. And it says that in uh, while it was trying to run, it didn't find URI in, in this initializer for rescue.rb. So we have an initializer set up that is completely unrelated to our tests. But here at the top, we're saying if we're in development mode, then set up rescue locally. Otherwise, set up rescue based on an environment variable. But this is really only supposed to run in production. So we actually can do an else if rails.env.production. There's a couple different things that you might run into when it's the first time that you're using test, the test environment. So this is one example of those that I've run into. Now I can say rspec uh, spec. You can also just keep it short and say, I wanna run all the tests in this directory by saying rspec spec and the spec directory will have several tests. Right now, uh, I just have my one file here for user spec. And so what I can do now is open up that user spec model and in here, you'll notice that um, we're doing a couple things. First, we're requiring this Rails helper, which is gonna include the gems and uh, a couple, a little bit of setup for us. Then we are using the rspec.describe method. We're passing in the class that we're describing and then specifying the type of test this is. So this is a model test. And then inside of this do end, we have a, uh, we're calling pending and passing in this, uh, passing in the string that's just saying this is a pending test file that no one has actually edited. So you would come in here and you would delete this and add your own RSpec test. 
So uh, we'll have a, another episode all about our R spec testing syntax, but for now we can just say like it um, can run tests basically. Uh, and we'll just get this up and running and we're gonna say expect false dot to be true because we want the test to fail. Now we can again run uh, R spec spec and we'll see that the test fails. All right, so now it's it shows us the actual failure that we expect. So the user can run tests. So the user was the, the subject class that was part of our user spec and then can run tests was the content in our it statement. And then this is telling us exactly the code that we that we wrote that had our expectation or our sort of assertion about that code that we were writing. And we got, or we expected true, but we got false. So this is our actual value and this is our expected value. So um, they're a little bit different uh, like we're expecting and then you pass in like the actual value to be the expected value which is kind of an interesting way to think about it because what you're passing in to expect is not actually the expected um, but assertions across all different test frameworks are going to work the same you're going to have some way to say like here is the thing that I created with my uh, my production code and it should match this hard-coded or asserted like actual thing in your test so that's a, a really common pattern. All right, so now if we want to like go over to our user spec and then modify this test so it was like expected false to be false and then we can run it. Now, when you're when you're running from the terminal and you have to write out r spec spec every single time, it can be pretty tedious, right? So running like r spec spec, you, even if you use the up arrow to run a specific test, it can be pretty small pretty slow. So something that I really recommend doing pretty early is um, configuring your editor so that uh, you can just go uh, directly from user spec here. I have, um, I have, I think it's um, test, vim test maybe. Yeah, so I'm using this plugin, uh, vim test, vim test. And this allows me to, in my vimrc, um, test, um, yeah, so I have leader, leader H and leader L set up to run the nearest test or run the entire test file. Okay, so these are tools that come from Vim test. And so if I do leader L, in my case it's space L and I'm inside of this file, then it will run all the tests in this file. And it's, when you're, when you're implementing a test driven workflow or when you're trying to write automated tests, it can be uh, excruciating if you need to like switch out of the context of the editor into some other terminal window or something just to run your tests. You want to get that feedback loop as tight as possible so that you're running your tests as tight as fast as possible. And so here we have one example and zero failures. This means this little dot here is an, is like the output for when the test is running and it passes. Um, so that is, that's how we can, that's how I tend to run the test is just directly inside the editor. So you might see me just like do something and then all of a sudden the tests are running. That's because I'm using, spacebar L or spacebar H to run either one test or all the tests in that file. So if I do spacebar H, now you'll notice that the, the execution here has a colon five at the end. So in your, in your own editor or you're in test, in your test framework, right? If you had R spec spec and then models user spec, this will run the entire file and all this, all the tests in that one file. Um, but if you wanted to specify a specific file, you can do colon five or something or colon and then the line number at the end. And that will just run the test that's like closest to that line number. So you might be able to edit your or configure your editor so that it runs tests like this. Um, but whatever. Okay. So that's how you install our spec, uh, our spec rails. Now, if I wanted to just generate a, a brand new model, for instance, right. And if I say like rails, G model dummy. Now this is going to run the underlying Rails generator to create these two files. And this is pretty convenient, right? Because if we're creating a model, we want both a migration and we want the model file. But it's also really handy if we also have the tests. So it would be great if like when we're generating the model file, it also generated a spec file for us, right? So if we, uh, let's remove this model. And what we can do is go into our application config and set it up so that when it's running generators, so let's open up here and go to config application.rb. And down here, uh, we can say config. Okay, so config.generator system test is nil, so it's not generating 
uh, system tests, but we want to say config.generators uh, do g, and then we can say g.test framework is equal to rspec. If we were again to generate that dummy model, you'll see that there was two additional files created. This rspec, um, rspec was invoked as part of the generation flow. This is the test framework that was invoked and that RSpec generator created this dummy spec file. So now we it automatically created both the model file and this dummy spec file. So that's cool, that's great. Now let's talk about the, the case where we want to say like Rails G scaffold, and maybe we wanted to add some like commenting system in here. So if we say comment, right, that will create the controller, it'll create the model, the migrations, it creates a whole bunch of stuff for us, right? Um, and so here at the top we get our migration, we get a comment model, we get the RSpec uh, for the comment model, and we're also going to get a bunch of other stuff. So as it's scaffolding the controller, RSpec will also create a request, uh, a request spec. Uh, it will also create specs for each of the views for edit, new, create, show, etc. And it will also create a routing spec. I have almost never, I, I, I've actually never written a routing spec, uh, and I've very, very rarely ever written, if ever, a view spec. So these, these kinds of specs are being generated, but you'll probably never actually write them in practice, at least in my experience. Helpers, I also very rarely actually implement a helper, and so I don't actually use the helper specs. Um, and so there's a lot of files that are being generated for us that we might not actually ever use. And so one thing that you can do is go back into that application um, HTML ERB thing and we can disable generation of many of the different specs. So this uh, test framework method here can actually be called not just as a setter but we can we can pass in a bunch of arguments. So we can pass in the test framework and then we can also pass in some configuration about the test framework. So if we look back at the Rails docs here for the for customizing generators, uh, if we have test framework. Yeah, so within our test framework, we can tell it that we want it to generate fixtures or factories or other other things, I believe. We can pass in, um, yeah, that we don't want it to generate uh, fixtures, that we don't want it to generate um, the spec helpers, etc. So let's see spec, uh, I'm sorry, helper. Yeah, okay, so let's just let's just disable all of the ones that I always disable. So we don't need any fixtures. We don't need any view specs. We don't need helper specs. We don't need routing specs. Now, some of the others might be handy or might come in handy, so I'm just gonna leave the rest in. These are the main ones that I wanted to get rid of, uh, were these three, because I, I never write those, and so those, will, those are the ones that we'll leave out. Okay, so now if we, again, uh, let's see, Rails D scaffold. Uh, comment. So let's clean up the comment and we'll clean up dummy. Rails D model dummy. Now if we were to say again Rails G scaffold uh, comment, it should only create the files um, for the for the generators that we left in. So let's see. So we invoked our spec here. We got our model spec. That's important. That's always uh, a really common thing that we'll want to use. Uh, we got a request spec. That can come in handy. We don't have any helpers, that's great. And okay, so now we're now we're good. So now we have a model spec and a request spec. Yeah, I think that's a great start. And that's also how I would generally set up our spec. All right, so let's end it there. And in the next episode, we'll go through and set up factory bots so that we can actually like create some factory objects in our tests. So we'll see you in a bit. Mm -hmm.